Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We have been studying through Philemon verse by verse, and we uh, come to the end of this short epistle. It's a fabulous message from the Holy Spirit, an illustration of what God has done for us, Since this is the conclusion, let's just take just a moment to set the scene of the epistle again. Philemon is a businessman apparently living in Colossae. How many slaves he had, we do not know. And I've pointed out to you the law of the land. The Greeks and the Romans were not very kind to slaves. The Roman law said that if a slave wronged his master in any way, he should be put to death. In fact, the Roman law said that if a slave killed his master, then every slave in the household would be put to death. We ran away from God and were slaves to sin, and we deserve death. So here's a slave by the name of Onesimus who wronged his master, Philemon. He flees to Rome just in time to see over 400 slaves put to death, knowing full well that he also was under the law, condemned to die, and there was nothing, nothing that he could do about it. If he goes back to Philemon, he will die. If he appeals to any court or he throws himself on the mercy of the court, he has a perfect illustration that there is no mercy when it comes to slavery. Over 400 are being put to death as he arrives in Rome. Now, I've heard things like, well, as luck would have it, Onesimus runs into Paul. Onesimus and Paul meet. I would imagine the last place that Onesimus would ever want to go is prison, and prison officials being a runaway slave. I think that we can see in that a clear illustration of the sovereign majesty of God. No man can come unto me except my Father which is in heaven. Drag him. Force him. We see the hand of God in the life of Onesimus. Or you can believe that a runaway slave met the Apostle Paul in a Roman prison because he was caught shoplifting and put in jail if you want to. I, I think he knew that that would have been his end. I do not know how they met, but I do know that they met by the sovereign power of God and the Holy Spirit. That Paul had the opportunity to tell Onesimus that he belonged to Jesus Christ. That gospel is not that Onesimus could belong to Christ if he, if he wanted to. Or he could go to hell if he wanted to. No. The good news was Onesimus, you are mine. I died for you. I bought you. The message of Philemon is not some historical account of a, of a runaway slave who through the intercession of the Apostle Paul is restored to his master without punishment. What it is, is a marvelous illustration of the grace of God in our lives. It's an illustration of how He knows us and how that He seeks us out. When Adam sinned, 
You know, I've had people say, you know, sin drives you to Christ. No way, no way. It drives you away from Christ. When Adam sinned, he ran. And God went looking for Adam. Adam didn't go looking for God. It was God who found Onesimus. It was God who found Onesimus and said, You are mine. Before time began, I chose you. I sowed you. I planted you. Well, why would you plant me as a slave and lead me uh, to leave my master? And I, I pointed out the passive voice in verse 15. He was made to leave Philemon. Well, the same was true of Adam. God placed Adam in the garden to sin. I'm not going to suggest to you that I know the mind of God other than, than He's revealed it in His Word, but I know, I know that for every one of you who belong to Christ, you've never, you've never been out of His sight and out of His hand. That everything that's ever touched your life in any way has touched your life that God, in order that God might mold you and make you what He wants you to be. I've suggested in other studies that I find it is so easy for Christians to praise God for all of the good things in their life. But what I don't hear, I don't hear Christians praising God for the bad things. And I put bad in quotes. I believe that God teaches us more through failure than He teaches us through success. If there is any danger in your lives, believe me, believe me, the danger comes from success, not from failure. It is success that leads us to believe that we are self-sufficient, that we don't need God, and we don't need His grace, and we don't need His guidance. We don't need His direction. We are the captains of our own destiny. Folks, success is a dangerous field to play in. God had placed Onesimus where he was. Imagine the stupidity of His disciples. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Not sure exactly, not exactly sure how he could sin in his mother's womb, but that was the question on their minds. And what did our Lord say? Christ said he didn't sin, he didn't sin, his parents didn't sin. This was done in order that the power of God might be shown in him. And I think if we were able to speak to that man today who was born blind from birth and ask him, well, you know, wasn't it a terrible thing that God made you go through blindness for 30 years just so that he could show his power in you? I seriously doubt that the man would even remember that he was born blind. If God wants to show His power in you, tell me, what better service could there be? What a marvelous opportunity that the God of eternity would decide to use me in any way to demonstrate His grace, His power, and His love. Dearly beloved, Onesimus was always His. In the human illustration, we see Onesimus under the threat of death. What could he do? Buy freedom? No way. Cast himself on the mercy of the court? He has already had a vivid illustration that there is no mercy there and there is no mercy in law. The law must be fulfilled and we stood condemned under the law 
and therefore we were the slaves of sin and the slaves of law. But then Christ came as our kinsman redeemer. God was not capable of redeeming us apart from the incarnation. And so the almighty, eternal God had to become man, become flesh, tabernacle among us, be our kinsman redeemer, that He might meet the demands of the law. We see Onesimus going back to Philemon, not with money, not with apology, but with mediation, demanding grace. And all through it, we've seen illustrations of the finished work of Jesus Christ, of the sovereign power of God in the direction of our lives. You'll never know that you trust Him that you believe Him, that you rest in Him until you're in troubled waters. Folks, smooth seas do not lead you to trust. Onesimus doesn't have any hope. No way can he remedy his condition. No way can he pay the debt. And now the mediation comes based on grace and we find that the mediator appealed on the basis of what he had done. And the basis of the, me of the mediation we see in, in our behalf is the finished work of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. If you are complete in Him, what is there left to be done? Prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given to you. It's going to be gracious hospitality. I trust that through your worship I shall be given to you. The Greek word given there is charizomai. It has to do with gracious forgiveness, gracious fellowship, Fellowship without condemnation, without fault. You don't anticipate going to heaven to face condemnation, but hospitality, gracious acceptance. There is therefore now no condemnation to those of you who are in Christ Jesus. That ought to be stressed. Why don't you live as though there's no condemnation? And suddenly, you are tied by chains of love, not by chains of law. There's a vast difference. I trust. I know that it's going to happen. First of all, there is the confidence that we are all to be reunited in the family in the household of God. I cannot in honor and in honesty diminish the message of grace. There is no condemnation to those of you who are in Christ Jesus. The word prepare there in the text is an imperative. It's a command. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. This is an aorist infin uh, infinitive, an, an imperative. The command wouldn't be there if there weren't confidence there. Secondly, lodging, I think is the word that people want to use in translating this word because they only want to put it in the human frame, that is, this is simply a story of a slave, Onesimus, 
and his master Philemon. But the word is not a bed, it's hospitality, welcome, food, everything that goes with the idea of hospitality. And that's how it ought to be used. The translators say, well, you know, the account is a slave and his master. So it must mean a lodging, a bed, a place to sleep. But the word is much grander than that. It's a word that goes with hospitality. For I trust that through your worship I am graciously to be given to you. Now you can say, you can say, here's a prisoner in Rome in a prison cell who hopes to get released and go see Philemon. That, that's true. That's, that's true. But what's the message to us? It's not important to me whether Paul thought he might be released and get back to Philemon or not. I think he, he was released. I think he did go back and see Philemon. Others do not believe that he was released. I think he was arrested a second time and beheaded. But be that as it may, those are historical facts. But what is important to us? What is the Scripture teaching you and me? That Jesus Christ is confident that the debt that He paid is sufficient. And He's confident that we will be in fellowship together in God's household and it'll be done through worship. The idea of worship concerning the sanctity and the, the security of God's family and of His household. And all I'm suggesting is that there is a greater message than what we see in the, the historical fact that there's a man in prison hoping to see a friend Philemon at Colossae. And that that confidence is resting upon what Christ has done. And now he names some names. And it's interesting that God knows my name. God knows my name. President Biden doesn't know my name. Donald Trump doesn't know my name. The, the governor of the state of Oklahoma doesn't know my name. Now, we don't have a mayor here, uh, you know, for, you know, we're an unincorporated village. But if we had a mayor, he probably wouldn't know my name. And folks, I don't want you to boot scoot by the few verses at the end of every epistle where God names names. Just, you know, kind of skip over that like, you know. Uh, he knows you by name. He says that He's branded your name on the palms of His hands. It's wonderful that the Eternal Majesty on high knows my name. And so He names some of them. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Fellow laborers. The thing that's just overwhelming to me is that their names appear in the Word of God. And in the same way that God knows them, He knows you. There's Lucas, that's Luke. Interestingly enough, the Holy Spirit used him to write two books. One we know as the Gospel of Luke, according to Luke. And the other we know as the book of Acts. It's of more interest that it is only through the Holy Spirit's use of Luke that we know very much about the Apostle Paul at all. 
we're pretty well convinced that he's a Gentile because Paul separates him from the circumcision. Therefore, he's probably a Gentile. He's called a physician in one place. Uh, Luke, the beloved physician. Apparently, because Luke was a medical professional, the Holy Spirit led him to work with Paul and to aid Paul in his medical problems. And so he finally winds up in prison with Paul. These are fellow laborers. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, that Demos has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has depart and is departed into Thessalonica. I want you to note that there's no word of condemnation here. I do not think that you should take that verse, a Demas hath forsaken me, as though, well, here's a Christian who turned back, uh, he's backslid, and he's now headed for hell. Uh, uh, Demas is no longer with me. I, I think we put too much in the word forsake. Apparently, he was, he was more interested in the world system than he was the gospel. And now, he's back working with Paul. I don't think that the Holy Spirit's intent was to single out a few, but to show us that we're known by name. He knows us. God knows who we are. In the final verse, verse 25, the grace of the Lord Jesus. Now your Bible has hour. The word hour is not there in the Greek. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There's only one other place that this full ending occurs, and that's in the epistle to the Galatians. An epistle that was written to address the very problem of, of law in the believer's walk. I recognize that we walk in the sphere of grace, not in the sphere of law, that we were under sentence of death with absolutely no ability to remedy that condition, and in that condition, Christ paid the debt. So that now through His mediation, we can stand before Him. We can stand before God. Everything credited to the account of Christ. If He owes you anything, put that on my account. And so we stand before Him blameless, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. Marvelous truth. But the flesh doesn't stand there, folks. I know that you walk in the sphere of grace, but the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with your spirit. That's why whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin because his seed remaineth in him and he has no ability to sin. It's the new man. It's the reason that Paul could declare in Romans 7, that which I do, I would not, and that which I would not, these I allow. Therefore, it is not I that sins, but sin which dwelleth in me. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is ever with that new creation. You cannot get out of that sphere of grace. To do that intellectually is to return to law. What says the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. 
think Ishmael and Isaac. And think old man, new man. The old will be cast out. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And with that, we, we finish this wonderful gem of an epistle, Philemon. I tried the best I can to tell you what I believe the spiritual message of this epistle is. May you rest in Him. We love you. We truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.